All right. Um, I guess I'll get started. Uh, that's always a, a tough act to follow, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, so what I'd like to, to start with is just thanking my collaborators on, on this paper. So uh, Alex Roby, who's a fantastic student at Penn, he's at the back here. He played a big part in this, as well as my uh, collaborators from Google, Stephen Tu, who should be here at some point this weekend, uh, and uh, Ting Nan Zhang. Uh, so, you know, for this community, I don't think I really need to motivate the importance of safety and guarantees when putting learning-enabled components in a control loop. So I thought I would try to motivate things, the work that we're doing, from a perspective that might appeal a bit more to the, the graduate students in the audience. Um, and that's this idea of graduate student dissent, right? So, you know, you have a fantastic idea or your advisor has a fantastic idea and you haven't heard of COCPs yet, so you're using a neural network and you're trying really hard to get this dumb half cheetah to do something interesting and it's just not, right? And so you spend the week hyperparameter tuning and your training curves are just going all over the place and after a week of staring at this, you start to have deep nightmares about these training curves. Um, this is actually from a blog uh, that Andre Karpathy runs, I think. Uh, but like more seriously, we look at this and we try to, we wanna understand why isn't this working, right? Why can't I get this to do something useful? And there's really kind of two options here. One is, if I spend more time hyperparameter tuning, I pick a better architecture, I change my cosine learning rate decay to whatever, um, maybe I can get it to work. The other perspective, the other possibility, is that this is just a really hard problem. And no matter what I do, it's not going to work. And right now, we really don't have a systematic way of differentiating between those two situations. So towards addressing that, we can take inspiration from an area that was just maligned by Stephen Boyd, which is robust control, um, right? In addition to respectfully maligned, I know, with love, I know. Um, and so in addition to H-infinity controllers that prevent these 1% things from going catastrophically wrong, arguably one of the more important practical uh, consequences of robust control is the identification of these fundamental limits that say that for some systems, all controllers perform poorly. All right, so my, my PhD advisor, John Doyle's favorite example that you can try at home is this uh, balancing an inverted pendulum in your hand. So if you have an adjustable pointer, you can try this at home. Um, if the stick gets shorter, the unstable pull gets worse and it's harder to balance. But if you wanna make this really impossible, you, you make the stick long, you put a baseball cap on so you can only look at it in the middle. And this leads to an approximate unstable pull zero cancellation. Um, and so we can actually identify these characteristics, look at the complementary sensitivity function, do all that nice work. Um, you know, but what this tells you, it doesn't tell you that you should give up and kind of go home. This tells you that you need to go back and talk to the engineers and tell them that you need to change the system. Right? So in this case, the silly example, you have bad sensing. You need to add better sensing. So what we've been working towards is um, a complementary or equivalent theory in the context of learning for control. Um, and so what we're trying to answer is the question of what makes learning controllers from dynamic data easy or hard. And the informal meta theorem that we've been converging towards is this idea that if I'm actually trying to find some good controller that leads to good performance, it should be easy to find. And conversely, bad controllers, controllers that lead to really, really bad performance where my optimal controller still sucks, those are gonna be hard to find and it tells me that I should maybe change my system. Now, I only have about seven minutes left, so we're not gonna answer this whole question today, but we're gonna focus on this idea of good controllers are easy to learn in the context of nonlinear systems. Um, again, not going to address the full-blown general uh, nonlinear reinforcement learning problem, and instead we're gonna use imitation learning as a case study to try to understand and insta instantiate some of these ideas. So I don't wanna make any assumptions about people being familiar with imitation learning, so I'll just do a brief introduction here. Um, the vanilla version of imitation learning looks something like this. I have an expert policy that I like. I deploy it on a system and collect a bunch of labeled pairs of data where I have the state as the input and the label would be the corresponding expert control input. I then feed this into a supervised learning problem, which I've just called a regression problem here to estimate some approximate policy pi hat. And if I'm happy with that, I deploy it on my system and cross my fingers that things work well. There are more sophisticated versions of this that kind of close this loop and adjust things, but this, is a good, this gives you a good flavor of what's going on there. Now, we like imitation learning because it tends to be a lot more data efficient and easier to implement than, say, reinforcement learning. 
But the challenge with imitation learning is this idea of distribution shift from training to test time. And so in particular, the issue here is that the data that I'm regressing against is data generated by my expert policy. So if I apply my fancy statistical learning theoretic tools to this, I can get guarantees that if my expert gives me another trajectory, my learn policy will do well. But that's not what I care about, right? I care about my learn policy doing well when I deploy the learn policy. So it leads to this chicken and egg problem, and it also can potentially lead to this idea of compounding, uh, compounding errors that, are, that can lead to catastrophic failure. So, you know, to illustrate this in a cartoon way, if I think of this as my expert data, and this cloud is a, a, a cartoon representation of my expert distribution, then, you know, suppose I run my imitation learning and then I take a test trajectory starting at this black point. My expert will take a step in this direction, but now because there's a small error in my learned policy, I'm gonna take a direction in the, I'm gonna take a step in this red arrow's direction. Now I end up over here, that's okay, I'm still in the uh, expert distribution, so I still end up with a small error. But now I'm in a little bit of trouble because I've gotten kicked outside of the expert training distribution. And so whereas my expert knows what to do, I'm gonna make a bigger error, which leads to me being even farther outside of my expert data, my training data, which leads to an even bigger error and things blow up on me. Right, and this is something that's really well known in the imitation learning community, and in the next slide I'll discuss ways that people have looked at addressing this. But the question that we're interested in is, you know, how do the underlying stability, safety, smoothness properties of my expert policy actually manifest themselves in the sample complexity of my learning problem? How much data do I actually need to collect? So in the interest of time, I'm gonna just do a very quick and incomplete overview of related work. Um, you know, so what I've been discussing is what's referred to as vanilla behavior cloning. That doesn't work well in practice in many cases. People have addressed this using online, on policy or off policy approaches. On policy basically means that I can query my expert during tests and ask it to correct the action of my learned policy. Off policy, you can think of it as, in a nutshell, I'm injecting noise during training to expand out the training, uh, the training set distribution. People have recognized that this is an issue and we need to worry about safe imitation learning in various communities from Bayesian deep learning to the controls community to the robotics community. Lots of very nice results with varying degrees of generality and guarantees, but what's currently lacking and what really got us interested in this question is a quantitative understanding of what makes this easy or hard. And what I'm gonna try to convince you of is that what's really important here is a specific notion of stability or robust stability in your underlying expert policy. Okay, so let's dive into a little bit of math now. Why is stability important? So we can talk about this distribution shift, this idea of how things look different from my expert and learned policy in terms of this discrepancy. All I'm doing here is co computing a running sum of the difference of the state induced by my expert policy and that induced by my learned policy starting from the same initial condition C. Now, I apologize for this slightly um, cumbersome notation. Uh, let's see, where's my arrow? Okay, I can't find my arrow, but this idea of X sub T superscript pi D of C, this means that I'm considering my state at time T under the policy pi D, that my data generating dish, uh, policy, starting from an initial condition C. I know this is a little bit cumbersome, but we actually need to keep track of all of this. So I'll try to remind you of, of what's important when needed. So now if I apply a naive bound to this, I don't assume anything about my underlying policy, except that you know, everything's kind of smooth and bounded. Then I can show the following uh, bound on the discrepancy on a new test initial condition. Now this expression on the right here is what you minimize in imitation learning, and we can do a good job of keeping that small. But what you see is you end up with this exponential dependence on the time horizon t. Right? We don't like that. That means that I have to collect a lot of data and the amount of data that I need gets bigger and bigger as the um, horizon grows. But if we kind of zoom out a little bit, what we can view this as is characterizing the difference between trajectories where one is a nominal expert policy and one is a perturbed version of that expert policy where the perturbation is the mismatch between my learned and expert policy. This is something that we've studied extensively in the context of nonlinear robust control through the notion of incremental input to state stability. So here's the technical definition. Don't worry about it. Conceptually, what this is telling you is that I have a system that will forget its initial conditions if there are no disturbances driving it. And alternatively, if I start at the same initial condition and, and I impose, uh, if I perturb one of the inputs or the trajectories, it's gonna lead to quantitatively bounded deviations between the two trajectories. Now this is gonna be the actual um, property that we need. 
And you can kind of push things through and show that under this idea of delta ISS, you can reduce this to dependence to being linear in T. So this is already a big win. However, if you kind of look at this, you realize that you can very, we've already provided a counterexample that in some cases this can be loose. So in particular, if I look at this original naive bound, and I assume that this product LB is less than one, then this is order one, right? This doesn't depend on the time horizon. So what this indicates is I need to do a little bit more than just this general notion of delta ISS, I need to quantify things. So one version of, a, one quantification of this is a notion of exponential delta ISS, which can be certified through contraction metrics. The details aren't important here. Intuitively what this is saying is that I'm asking for my nonlinear system to essentially behave like a linear system in terms of its stability. And in this case, we can actually reduce our dependency to be order one, to be constant. Because things are decaying away exponentially, you sum this over time, it, it goes to a constant. But this is very strong, we're asking a lot here, right? What if my system isn't exponentially contracting? So this motiva motivated us to think of a kind of more general version of this that allows for polynomial decay rates. Um, again, this is a very technical definition, and so I apologize for that, I'll try to parse it for you. What we're essentially trying to characterize here is the gain from a perturbation input signal U to the corresponding discrepancy between two trajectories. But we're thinking about this at a signal level. And this ugly kind of min thing on the left here is to try to capture the phase transition about the unit circle. So if I have a polynomial, you know, x squared de decays really quickly inside the unit circle, but it's worse outside. And this is, this is capturing. And so what's nice about this is if you push all this math through, you're actually able to get something that's polynomial in T that actually interpolates very nicely between exponential and order, uh, and, and order constant, depending on the underlying stability properties. And now you can certify this with an incremental Lyapunov certificate. And just as an example, um, sensible things work. So if I have a contracting system, I can use the geodesic uh, distance between two points. That works as a Lyapunov function that certifies this property. And we also came up with a toy example where you can actually tune the underlying stability properties explicitly to kind of interpolate between just bounded Lyapunov stability and exponential stability. Um, okay, so I'm way over time here, um, but if we very quickly uh, think about what this would look like in the context of imitation learning, what you want to do is rather than just solving the supervised learning problem, I'm going to solve this imitation loss, and I'm going to add the additional constraint that my learned policy actually satisfies this IGS property. Okay, and the reason that this is nice is you have this key identity here where I can rewrite my expert policy as my learned policy plus a perturbation. Right, so I can use the stability of my, of my learned policy to carry over the nice proper guarantees of my expert. Uh, and then this discrepancy term is exactly what I'm minimizing. So this allows me to carry through some nice guarantees. Um, again, I, I apologize, I did not get the timing right at all, but if you push this through for uh, stability constrained behavior cloning, you can actually get an end-to-end -end guarantee um, on the imitation loss that scales polynomially in T. We also have a dagger or episodic-like version of this that you can check our poster out for more details on, and this also goes through. Um, and what's kind of nice here is that depending on the underlying stability of your system, you either end up with sampled complexity bounds that are independent of the horizon if you have an exponentially contracting system, or you end up with something that's polynomial if you have this kind of toy system that varies in terms of its stability. And importantly, this allows you by varying this parameter P here in our toy system to interpolate between something that has really bad dependency on T and really good dependency on T. So really um, explicitly showing the underlying dependency of your sample complexity on the stability of your expert. And what's kind of neat here is we actually identify a class of systems that have sublinear and T um, dependence that aren't exponentially contracting. And so this actually ends up being predictive in practice in terms of experiments. So we took this tunable system where, again, you can think of P as being um, the larger P gets, the less stable my system is. And we ran various experiments for both behavior cloning and this episodic dagger-like system uh, algorithm. And the way to read this table is that the more stable my system is, the easier it is to learn. So you can see that these losses get a lot easier. And also adding explicit IGS constraints tends to help things. So what I want to quickly end with is a, to highlight the fact that there's one really kind of unsatisfying shortcoming in this approach, which is that enforcing this IGS constraint on your learned policy is actually very difficult to do. 
We had to resort to heuristics where we uh, uh, um, enforce this inequality point-wise. But I'm happy to say that we've, in some new work, we've completely addressed this idea. Uh, we've completely fixed this shortcoming. And it's this context of Taylor series imitation learning where we show that if you, instead of just matching the policy, um, you match the first P order terms of the Taylor series expansion of your learned and expert policy, where P is again determined by the underlying properties of your expert, of your expert then um, things work nicely. So depending on the properties of your IGS function, um, you either need to learn, let's say, just the policy or the policy plus its Jacobian. And we can push nice guarantees through as well. And these things work really well, for example, in Mujoko, we're comparing BC, Dagger, and Dart with versions augmented with learning the Jacobian loss, and things work really nicely. And I had a nice video for you, but I went way over time, so I'm just gonna stop there. Um, thank you very much. Oops. I guess there's no time for questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> find Nikolai during the poster session and ask your questions to him. Uh, we are gonna have our second po uh, paper, Resiliency of Perception-Based Controllers Against Attacks. Yes. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Amir Khazrai. I'm a PhD candidate at Duke University, and I'll be presenting our work, uh, Resiliency of Perception-Based Controllers Against Attacks. So the recent progress in computer vision and deep learning has created a new generation of control systems that incorporate perception data for decision-making and control. Uh, however, there is a very limited uh, knowledge about the resiliency of these systems against attacks. Uh, as motivated by this, we want to know which perception-based control systems are uh, vulnerable to attacks. Uh, for example, consider an autonomous vehicle that uses uh, image plus some other physical sensors in order to uh, control the vehicle. Uh, if there exists an attacker that can change the observation, uh, we want to know how to evaluate the impact of STLC attacks uh, on these uh, types of perception-based control systems. And in our approach, uh, we first model the uh, perception-based control in the presence of attacks, and then uh, we, intru we introduce the notion of STLCness that is independent of the deployed intrusion detector. And then we drive the condition for the existence of uh, impactful and still see attacks. Uh, there is a line of works that consider, uh, that uses the uh, vulnerability of deep neural networks to uh, small changes. And uh, they actually design the attack by putting some uh, uh, small patches or add noise to the uh, image such that they can uh, abruptly uh, change the control input. However, these types of attacks do not consider the stiltiness condition, and they have shown to be detected uh, by some kind of intrusion detector, as shown by uh, Kai et al. And uh, motivated by this, we consider a perception-based control systems uh, in the presence of intrusion detector. And uh, we assume a plant with nonlinear input affine dynamics. We assume that the perception data is a mapping from a state to potentially high dimensional uh, image pixels or uh, LiDAR data points. Um, and then we also assume there are some physical sensors and we use a standard observation model uh, with Gaussian zero mean noise. Uh, 
Uh, we also assume that there is a perception module that takes the image and uh, imperfectly measures a subset of uh, states. And there exists an end-to-end -end, uh, controller that directly maps the image and also uh, the sensor measurements to the input control. For the intrusion detector, we assume uh, that um, it receives a sequence of measurements that consists of perception module output and also the sensor measurements. And it solves a binary uh, hypothesis testing problem at each time step. And um, it is desired actually for the system to have probability of true detection be greater than probability of false alarm uh, in order to detect the attack. Uh, throughout the paper, we make two assumptions on our perception-based control system. We assume that there exists a safe set around the operating point uh, that perception module's error is bounded. And also we assume that the closed loop control system, when we turn off the noise, is uh, exponentially stable. Uh, to model the attack, uh, we assume that the attacker has full knowledge about the system's dynamics and also uh, the system's architecture and has enough computation power to calculate a suitable attack vector ahead of time. Uh, we assume that uh, the attacker can uh, compromise the perception data by uh, replacing it uh, by a false data called uh, ZTA. And the attacker can compromise the physical sensors by adding an uh, attack vector at each time step. And the goal of the attacker is to be impactful, meanwhile be still seen. For the notion of still seen as we consider the most general format, uh, we call an attack to be a strictly still see if there is no detector that can satisfy probability of true detection be greater than probability of false alarm at any time. And it is uh, epsilon is still see for a given epsilon, the difference between probability of true detection and false alarm be greater than epsilon. And in theorem one, we actually found the condition for each of these uh, still seenness notions. And we show that if the KL divergence between the distribution of the observation when the system is under attack and distribution of the observation when the system is attack free become equal to zero, then we can claim that the attack is strictly still see. However, if the KL is less than or equal the log of one over one minus epsilon two, then we can claim that it's uh, epsilon is still C. Uh, to formalize the attacker's uh, objective, uh, we uh, define the sequence of attack vectors to be epsilon alpha successful attack. If there exists a time step after the attack starts, we call it T prime such that for that specific time step, the norm of states become greater than alpha and also the attack B epsilon is still C during the whole period of the attack. When such a sequence of attack exists, we call the system epsilon alpha attackable. And now the question is, uh, under what condition there exists the epsilon alpha attacks? Before addressing, addressing that question, uh, we define two attack strategies, uh, where in both attack strategies, the attacker shifts the image uh, captured by the states by ST value. That ST evolves over time um, uh, with some dynamics, and also the attacker subtract CS times ST from the physical sensor measurements. And the difference between these two attack strategies is that for the first one, the attacker has access to the estimate of states. However, for the second one, the attacker just uses the function f to evolve the state, auxiliary state s. For example, to have an idea to how this attack works on images, let's consider there exists an inverted pendulum. And the actual pendulum pod is the red one. And the attacker, in order to find uh, the attacked image uh, with ST equal to 45 degree, it needs to 
uh, rotate the inverted pendulum 45 degree to the left and uh, find the attack image, which is the green pendulum bug. Uh, in theorem two, we found the condition uh, under which uh, for the attack strategy one, there exists a sequence of epsilon alpha attacks. And basically we have shown that if the closed loop system is exponentially stable and the open loop system is unstable, uh, then under some condition over the constants of uh, Lipschitz uh, and also uh, exponentially stable constants, uh, there exists such a sequence for uh, the considered system. And we have actually found the condition for attack strategy too, but due to the time limit, I cannot go into that. Uh, so uh, for LTI systems, uh, we basically showed that uh, both of the attack strategies fall into the same category, with, which means the attacker doesn't need to know, have access to the uh, state, estimate of the states. And in uh, corollary one and two, we uh, found the condition uh, for which there exists a sequence of epsilon alpha attack. Um, so we have considered two case studies, inverted pendulum and uh, autonomous vehicles, where uh, in inverted pendulum we assumed uh, there exists an end-to-end -end deep reinforcement learning controller that directly maps the image and also physical sensors to the input to keep the pendulum uh, up in the air. Uh, the above figure, the left above figure shows the actual pendulum, the image of the actual pendulum, and the left down shows the uh, image that the attacker sends to the controller. And it is assumed that the attacker starts at time uh, zero. So uh, before the attacker starts, everything is normal. And um, once the attacker starts at time zero, you can see that pendulum falls and however the image that is sent to the controller uh, in the left down figure uh, shows that the uh, pendulum is up in there. And we have also found that uh, we use the chi-square based intrusion detector and we have shown that the attack is still C. We have also implemented the attack on autonomous vehicle that uses end-to-end -end controller to uh, keep the car between the lanes. And it is assumed that the attack starts at time zero. You can see the car is in the center of the road before the attack, but once the attack starts, it deviates and it goes off the road. And meanwhile, we have shown that the attack uh, is still C for such system. So in conclusion, we have considered uh, the resiliency of uh, perception-based control systems with nonlinear dynamics. Uh, we introduced the notion of uh, stillness in a general form that is independent of the deployed intrusion detector. And we derived a, a sufficient condition under which there exists an epsilon alpha uh, impactful attacks. Thank you. One question while the next speaker gets set up. Hi, right, thanks for the talk. Um, I guess I'm a little disheartened because it seems like the message is that bad guys win under these conditions. Um, so what are the conditions under which like these attacks would not succeed in the way you described? So in that case, we can say that the system is safe. And I mean, under like either the attacker can attack the system and will be uh, detected by the intrusion detector. And a lot of uh, systems that are safety critical have the condition that if they, if the attack is being detected, they immediately go into the safe mode that they use probably, uh, they either like shut down the the whole control system and try to recover it. And uh, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, our third presentation is going to be on robustness certificates for implicit neural networks and mixed monotone contractive approach. Hello everybody, my name is Saber and I'm presenting our work on robustness certificate for implicit neural networks. Um, so let me start by saying that uh, recent advances in machine learning has increased the computational power of neural networks. However, they have been shown to be fragile with respect to input perturbations. So an instance of this fragility, which has been studied very extensively in machine learning community is uh, what's called adversarial perturbation, which are very carefully designed uh, small perturbation in the input of neural networks which can lead to very large changes in their output. Uh, because of these kind of instances where ne neural networks can become brittle, the robustness analysis is becoming more and more important. And when, when we want to study robustness of neural networks, two questions uh, usually naturally arises. The first question is kind of robustness verification. We are given neural nets, how robust is our neural net? And the second one is a kind of a design problem, robustness uh, training, how can we design a neural net which is robust? So in this talk, I'm, I'm mostly uh, focusing on the verification. I will comment a little bit about training later, but, but we mostly focus on the verification problem. So let me narrow down the problem a little bit more for you. So what we want, what we are interested to know is that given an input and a, a, a set of perturbation around that input, we want to check if the output of neural nets satisfy a certain specification, safety specification, which we describe it by a set S. Uh, so essentially, we want to use robustness analysis to kind of over approximate this output of our neural net under those perturbations and check if that over approximation satisfies our uh, safety uh, constraint or not. So uh, this, this framework has been, uh, has been studied uh, extensively in, in the literature and different approaches have been used to over approximate the output of neural nets. Examples include Lipschitz estimates, interval arithmetics, or semi-definite programming. Okay, uh, so another, part, another uh, relevant piece of literature is the, the notion of implicit neural nets, which I need to introduce here. So implicit neural nets are a class of learning algorithms where they replace the notion of explicit hidden layers in neural nets with uh, one single implicit layer. So essentially, if you look at a, a feedforward neural net, you can see that the, the output can be obtained from input by recursively applying activation functions and weight functions uh, uh, in a recursive manner. However, for implicit neural nets, uh, things are a little bit different because output is defined uh, as an implicit function of the input using a fixed point equation which I show here. Okay, so now you might ask why, why do we care? Why do we need to use implicit neural nets? So actually implicit neural networks can be considered as one instance of a more general context of implicit learning where the input output behavior in our learning algorithms are defined as an implicit function of each other. So what I showed you was a fixed point equation, the relation between input and output. That relation can be a dynamical system or differential equation, for example, in neural ODEs. It can be an optimization problem in many frameworks such as OpNet or other frameworks. So uh, we can consider our implicit neural nets as a, uh, in this context. And there has been several advantages for using implicit learning compared to traditional learning. For example, they can have better representation due to their flexibility in architecture. In some specific problems like optimization problem, they have shown to outperform a traditional uh, learning algorithm. And they can have significant memory reduction compared. Okay. So uh, now I go back to, to our model of implicit neural nets defined using a fixed point equation and we want to study their robustness. So two challenges appear here. The first one is that because our neural net is defined using an implicit equation, a fixed point equation, we, we, we must make sure that uh, our system is well posed. We have a solution for that fixed point. And the second one is the challenge that we always have is how can we over approximate the output of, a, of our neural net. So in this talk and in our paper, the approach that we take is a dynamical system perspective toward it. So instead of considering our implicit neural net as a fixed point equation, we consider it as a dynamical system. 
And then the well-posedness problem would become the problem of existence and uniqueness of equilibrium point. And the robustness problem would equivalently become the problem of forward reachability of the dynamical system. And this, this correspondence between I and Ns and uh, dynamical system has an elegant uh, 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 consequence that we can use the tools and techniques from dynamical system to study I and Ns. So in particular, in this talk, I want to introduce two tools from dynamical system which we use to study over INN. The first is contraction theory, and the second is mixed monotone system theory. So the next slide, I will open a parenthesis for two, for next two slides, describing what these two framework is, and then I will explain to you how we use these two to study of the robustness of our INN. So I'm sorry these slides are a little bit dense, but I will explain to you. So. Uh, what's a contracting system? A, system? a dynamical system is called contracting if every, with respect to a specific norm, if every two trajectory that you consider from that system, the, the distance between them decreases with time. Uh, one of the main results in contraction theory is that contractivity of a vector field can be completely characterized by something called the logarithmic norm of it is Jacobian. So logarithmic norm is kind of, which is also called matrix measure in some context, it's kind of the directional derivative of the norm. And for special cases like L1, L2, L infinity, we have closed form formula for that. So very nice, we can compute that. Um, so contraction theory for dynamical system, it has been introduced to study stability of dynamical system. But here, we want to use it for well posedness of our INN. So essentially what we need is kind of existence of equilibrium. So the result that we kind of borrow from contraction theory here is that if a time invariant dynamical system is contracting, it has a unique equilibrium point and every trajectory converges to this. Okay, so this was my brief introduction of contraction theory. Now we go to the second tool that we are using, mixed monotone system theory. Uh, mixed monotone system theory is, uh, it, it, it associated with a dynamical system or control system, n-dimensional control system. It, it embeds it into a two n-dimensional system called embedded system. Uh, and the thing that it does is that it, it separates the role of cooperative and uh, competitive states and control. So as you can see, this embedded dynamical system can be considered as a monotone dynamical system with respect to a, a suitable order on R2n, which we call the southeast order. And finding uh, the embedded system is usually not easy. Uh, it might not even be unique. We might have several embedded systems. Uh, but there, are, there exist different approaches for computing these embedded systems. So you might ask, what's the point of this embedding? So the whole point is that we can do reachability analysis for original system using just single trajectory of the embedded system. So if I can find one single trajectory of this embedded system, which here I showed with blue, these, at every time, these two trajectories give me the lower bound and upper bound of a box approximation for the reachable set of the original system. And that's exactly what we need for, for, for studying uh, reachability. So, with that, I close the parenthesis on, on the tools that we study, and I will go back to the INN, implicit neural nets, and I want to do robustness analysis. One of the key elements that we are going to introduce here to do this robustness analysis is the notion of embedded INN. So before that, let me, let me tell you that every, every matrix, we can decompose it into a metzeler part and non-metzeler part. Of it. So if you don't know what's a metzeler matrix, a metzeler matrix is a matrix whose off-diagonal elements are, are non-negative. So um, I showed an example here of how we can do the, this decomposition. And now I'm going to use this decomposition to define the embedded INN. So first, I will consider the dynamical system associated with my INN. It's a dynamical system on RN. Then we show that using the mixed monotone system theory, we can find a very nice closed form for the embedded system associated to this dynamical system as this. As you can see in the embedded system, we have embedded dynamical system, we have this metzeler part and non metzeler part of the weights. So this is a dynamical system coming from the mixed monotone system theory. And indeed, surprisingly, we can see that this embedded system is a dynamical system for another INN, which has twice as much neurons as the original INN, and we call that the embedded INN. So essentially, this is a dynamical system associated with I an INN, which has this uh, fixed point equation. And we call this embedded INN. Okay, so you might ask what's the, the whole point of using embedded INN? This is all for reachability analysis. So our main result in this paper is showing that if the logarithmic norm with respect to infinity norm of uh, matrix A, which is our weight matrix, is less than one, then we can show that our INN is well posed. We have a unique equilibrium point. 
Our embedded INN is also well posed, and we have a unique equilibrium for that, and we can bound the output of the original INN using the fixed point of the embedded INNs, right? So if you want to interpret it differently, assume that you are given uh, an INN, and you have an input and a box uh, uh, for perturbation of your input. And you're interested to bound the output of your INN under this box uh, perturbation. So the output can have a very weird shape. You don't care. What you do is that you use your embedded INN to find a box over approximation of the output. Um, so I have to say that this approach that we're using here, it has a very nice connection. Uh, and it's kind of a generalization of interval bound propagation which has been studied in the literature, in machine learning literature. So with that, I will, I will go to the numerical examples that we do. We, um, we study INNs for classification on MNIST data sets. Uh, so uh, we consider an INN with 100 neurons, and we train them using a NEMON algorithm. This is an algorithm that we already developed in our neurons paper for, uh, for training INN. And then, for every test data, we consider a box of perturbation around that test data, and we want to make sure that all the elements in that box are being classified as a correct digit. So, so how can we, uh, so we, we, do, we, do, we, we, appro we approximate the output of our neural nets using two approaches, using a Lipschitz approach and our mixed monotone approach. So the Lipschitz, bound, the Lipschitz approach is based on, again, our neural paper where we could find an a Lipschitz bound on the output of our input output Lipschitz bound of our neural nets. And then the result of our simulation is shown here. As you can see on the x-axis, we have the, uh, the amplitude of our perturbation. And on the y-axis, we have the accuracy of our, our test, uh, our estimates. So what we can see here is that our Lipschitz, the Lipschitz approach, which we already had in our neural paper, it will, it will lead to very bad result. It, it, uh, uh, decay sharply and go to zero very quickly under a very small amount of perturbation. However, the mixed monotone approach are going to give us a better uh, estimate of, uh, of robustness. Uh, well, these two, the difference between these two are actually the way we apply it on the output. Um, so comparing this with ground truth is a little bit complicated because ground truths require computing all the instances of the perturbation. So what I do is that I will compare these with the empirical robustness of neural nets under two specific attack, projected gradient descent and fast uh, gradient sign method. And we will see still that uh, there is a, well, if you notice the, the difference between the scaling in the x-axis here, you will see that the, the, the implicit neural nets are, are really robust. And what we get is there is still a huge gap between what we get as a certified robustness and what's the empirical robustness on this attack. So, uh, okay, with that, I will, I will stop here. And in conclusion, we use a dynamical system approach uh, for studying robustness of neural networks. Uh, we, in particular, we use two uh, frameworks from dynamical system, contraction theory, mixed monotone system theory. And we could use these two, combine them together to find hyper rectangular over approximation of INNs. And for future direction, we, we, consider, consi we consider applying these approaches to training robust neural nets and also reachability analysis of a closed loop system where the INN is, uh, is a controller. For a question? The last talk of the session is going to be on modeling partial observable systems using graph-based memory and topological priors. Cool. All right. So reinforcement learning exhibits superhuman performance when it has access to the true underlying state of the world. 
We see this uh, in video games like the Atari benchmark. Uh, we see this in board games such as chess or Go, where one look at the screen or board will tell you everything you need to know about the world. But it turns out in many problems we're interested in, we don't have access to this underlying state. And so we call these problems partially observable. The way we solve these is we need to estimate the state using what we've seen in the past, and at least in RL circles, this is generally called memory. So where can we actually use this memory? Uh, I have a couple examples here. Um, for example, you can count cards at the casino to improve your returns over time. Uh, you can build maps as you navigate new environments. Or partway through your episode, you can ask questions to help fill in gaps in your knowledge. Uh, right now, the go-to memory architectures in reinforcement learning uh, tend to be sequence models that come from supervised learning. These broadly fall into these two categories, recurrent neural networks, such as uh, LSTMs, or attention-based methods like transformers. Uh, both of these methods will basically take a sequence of observations and produce uh, output Q values or uh, action probabilities if you're talking about policy gradient-based methods. But it turns out that recurrent neural networks and transformers don't work as well in reinforcement learning as they do in supervised learning. Even in supervised learning, these sequence models are generally harder to train than normal MLPs or convolutional neural networks. Uh, in reinforcement learning, we have a high variance and potentially sparse reward signal. This is because our reward function is generally high variance and also sparse. Uh, we have a non-stationary target. That's just kind of how RL works. And although in theory the sequence model should still converge to the optimal policy, we find that the sample complexity in reinforcement learning is so high that in practice this often doesn't happen. So what happens is you'll now find a ton of papers um, where people have realized this and they've come up with uh, designing their own memory for a specific task. Um, and so what the designers will do here is they will embed their prior knowledge in the architecture of the memory itself. Now, what do I mean by that? So uh, for navigation-based tasks, you might see some sort of uh, key point matching, uh, you know, estimating the position of different observations, and then taking the, uh, uh, the nearby observations and then merging this into one single representation, right? Uh, you have applications in medicine, too, where you can represent uh, a patient's response to various medicines or symptoms as a, a mixture of Gaussian processes. Um, or you might be, uh, for, for cases like poker, you can actually explicitly store every bet your opponent makes, and then when you come up with a bet, try and predict how they're going to bet. And in doing so, you can increase your returns. So, so far, we have these sequence models from uh, supervised learning that are very general, but they have a high sample complexity. We have task-specific models that do well, but you need to write a new one for every specific task you're trying to solve. And so I started reading uh, some papers, and I wanted to see, is there a compromise in between? Uh, there really wasn't, so that's kind of the point of this paper. We proposed something called graph convolutional memory, or GCM. And this is somewhere in between these uh, sequence models, like an LSTM, and a more task-specific memory models. Uh, you can basically break down the way GCM works into three steps. Uh, First, we take incoming observations, and we just add them as a node in a graph. Second, we use something called a task-specific topological prior to actually construct incoming edges to this node we've just added. Um, and this is really kind of the novel part of our framework. Um, I won't go that much into detail, but the topological priors are basically a dynamic programming approach to determining the connectivity of the graph. So the idea is you provide a, a function that determines the neighborhood for a specific observation or node in the graph. And you run this each time you add a node to the graph, and now you're actually left with a graph with varying connectivity. So for a dynamics task, you might have a prior like this n function up here, and this would produce a line graph over time. Or maybe for a spatial task, you might want to connect uh, vertices based on their proximity with each other. The point is the prior is usually like a one-liner set comprehension. Uh, which is fairly easy to implement and change. Okay, so now that we have the topological prior, we can basically connect that node, and we have now uh, a graph data structure. We can now uh, extract the underlying state, or state estimate, s hat of t, using a graph neural network, or GNN. 
So steps one and three here are completely general, like an RNN or transformer. You can apply these to any partially observable reinforcement learning task. And then step two is where you can actually plug in information about the problem you're trying to solve uh, to basically accelerate learning. Okay, so I think examples are kind of the best way to learn, so I've, I've laid out a few and we're gonna go through them. Uh, the first example is stateless cart pull. Uh, I imagine many of you are familiar with this. You basically have an inverted pendulum on a mobile cart. Your task is to balance it. Um, and so the equations of motion here are a set of second order PDEs. Um, we call this stateless cart pull because we actually don't provide all the observation needed to solve the task. We just provide uh, the position of the pole and the cart. And so what would a topological prior for this task look like in GCM? It's really simple. It's a line graph. The process of creating edges, this topological prior, is just connect the previous vertex to the next vertex, right? And so once you have this chain, you can plug it through into your GNN and get that state. So we actually ran some experiments. Um, we compare uh, GCM against some state-of-the-art sequence models. So um, on the x-axis, sorry, what point is it? Yeah. On the x-axis here, uh, we have the training time step. On the y-axis, we have the reward. Oh, there. Um, and so on the right, we have our various models. We have an MLP. That's no memory, so that's what happens if you don't have any memory at all. LSTM, uh, the GTRXL, that is a transformer designed specifically for reinforcement learning. DNC is the differentiable neural computer. And finally, ours is in purple. And so there's two things I want to point out here. First, GCM is really the only one that can converge to the maximum reward here, at least in practice. And second is actually the variance shading. So if you look at these other sequence models, they tend to have quite a lot of wigglies and high variance shading, whereas with GCM, there's quite little variance, and then once you converge, you stay converged, which is quite nice. Okay, but um, cart pull is really simple. Can we apply this to more complex tasks? Uh, the second task we're gonna look at is concentration. This is also known as the memory card game. Uh, for those of you who are, are not familiar, you have a bunch of playing cards face down. Your goal is to flip two pairs, uh, sorry, two cards face up, and if they match, you get a, a point, right? Uh, if not, you flip them back face down and you go again. So the point is just remember where you've seen cards in the past, right? So what does, the act, what does the topological prior look like here? Uh, well, it's actually really, really simple. It's just the identity prior. Um, if the observations mask, so if we have a jack here and a jack here, we simply draw an edge from this observation to this observation. And so, in, in basically just a few lines of code, we can embed the, the rules of this game into a uh, topological prior. And so we ran another experiment. Um, this is for 12 cards face down. Uh, the X and Y axes are the same as the cart pull example, same baselines. We see more or less the same thing here. So we see that um, GCM is the only one that can converge to the maximum reward, which is 1.0 in this case. And again, we see that it tends to have slightly lower variance than these other reinforcement learning based methods. Okay, but even that was kind of a contrived example. Um, so we wanted to try something a bit more real world. And so for a real world task, we opted to do visual navigation where our agent gets a first person view. The underlying task and reward function is area coverage. Uh, so what does the prior look like here? We actually didn't think too hard about it. We just did a, a basic proximity prior. Uh, so just connect two vertices if they're within some distance D from each other. Um, again, this is kind of repeating myself, but we see that GCM tends to outperform the baselines and tends to have slightly lower variance shading. Okay, so now it's time for the caveats. I showed you some nice plots that say this is the best. Now I'm gonna tell you why that's not the case. Um, all of our tasks were relatively simple. We run it on academic hardware. If you have access to GPU compute clusters, if you're Google or OpenAI, you have no reason to use this method. Um, transformers and LSTMs will eventually converge to the optimal solution, but it just turns out that, unless you have a lot of money, it's kind of hard to do this in practice. Um, you need to select good priors. So in the paper, we do ablation studies of various priors on tasks not suited for those priors. Um, so what's kind of interesting is actually if we take a um, temporal-based prior for the navigation example, the results look almost identical to an LSTM. Um, and if you do even worse priors, you can actually degrade into the performance of an MLP. That's more or less lower bound here. Um, and again, transformers and LSTMs, they don't require prior knowledge. 
but this is kind of the no free lunch theorem. Uh, if you have some additional information, you can learn faster and more reliably. If you don't, go for a more general method. And then finally, I just kind of want to end on some uh, efficiency remarks. Uh, this is more, this is a uh, back of the napkin math, so take it with a grain of salt. But if we were saying running a really long episode, a million time steps where each observation is 128 dimensions, you could train this using a GCM in a, with a 768 megabytes of memory and one forward pass, whereas a transformer would take roughly four terabytes. So good luck training that on any, uh, any GPU in the next 10 years. Um, LSTM, you can do this in constant memory more or less, but uh, it requires one million forward passes through the network, which takes quite a while. On the right here, we just have the number of parameters in each of these models. So GCM is a purple one down here. Uh, you can see it has roughly double the number of parameters of a two-layer, multi-layer perceptron, and roughly half the parameters of an LSTM. So it's, it's quite parameter efficient, especially if you compare it with these more complex models over here, right? I should have also said the z-axis is basically the, the hidden size of the model. So as you increase the, the hidden size, how do the parameters scale? Yep. And uh, PIP install will package at this link if you want to try it out. And I will take questions. Speaker gets set up. Thanks for the talk. Um, I wonder if in your experiments, for example, in the uh, inverted pendulum, you contrasted your results versus something like state, state augmentation or augmentation of the observations to sort of have like a fairer comparison? So I'm sorry, you're asking if we were, say, to compare our method with just a method that takes in three of the observations that's hard-coded, like a task-specific exactly. method. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, we didn't really compare against that. We compared against mostly sequence models. I can tell you that those models work very well, right? Um, Task-specific models in general, um, they're hand-designed for the task. They will always work very well. It's just sometimes you as a designer maybe want to apply your task as something like, like uh, I don't know, self-driving and you don't want to try and think too hard about all the various parts that you need and when you need them, right? Um, yeah, does that answer? Thanks. Um, this talk actually concludes our first oral presentation sessions. Uh, before moving forward with our program, we first want to thank uh, Palo Alto Event Center uh, to make this um, happening um, because they were so supportive to um, have this person in, uh, ha have this uh, event in person in less than 24 hours um, and uh, we are really grateful for them. Now we are going to have a coffee break and at 11.45, uh, sorry, at 11.15, yes, 11.15, I'm sorry, uh, we are going to be back here for our next keynote speaker. Thank you. <laughs>